Today is April 5th, 2007. We are at the home of Walter Scott Price, Jr. He is being interviewed for the Veterans History Project. My name is Ann Pontillo. I am his daughter. I will ask questions for Walter to answer to participate in the interview. Walter, will you please state your name and address for the camera? My name is Walter S. Price, Jr. My address is 255 Placerata Avenue, Auburn, California. And your date of birth? And my date of birth is January the 17th, 1915. What branch of service did you serve in? I served in the U.S. Army, uh, 36th Division Artillery. What rank did you achieve? Uh, sergeant. And where did you serve? I served in uh, Africa, Italy, France, Alsace-Lorraine, Germany, and Austria. Tell us about when you were drafted into the U.S. Army. When I was 26 years old, uh, in February of 1941, uh, and 10 months before Pearl Harbor, uh, I was drafted into the United States Army. Uh, at the time, I was a dynamite shooter on a seismograph crew in Alvin, Texas. Uh, but they placed us on a train with about a hundred men and went to Houston, Texas, where we were sworn into the U.S. Army. And they took us to a restaurant and served us lunch. And after lunch, they took us to another train and carried us to Camp Bowie, Texas. Tell us about your first boot camp experience at Camp Bowie, Texas. When the train arrived at Camp Bowie, they told us to put our civilian clothes in a box and address it to our ex-home where we had come from. And they issued us two pair of pants and socks and shoes and shirts and shorts and then told us to leave one pair of pants and one shirt and one shoes and one socks and one pair of shorts and go into the bath tent and take a bath and get ready to be a soldier. Uh, when I came back out to put my clothes on, one pair of pants had been stolen, and which irritated me considerably since I suspected that the sergeant had was the same size uh, as I was and that he had stolen one pair of clean pants for himself from me. And it took me months to find a, a place to steal a pair to take this place. Walter, you had some difficulty at boot camp learning how to follow orders and take um, uh, orders from the um, oh. commanding officer. Tell us about your boot camp experiences with that. One of my first bad experience was that the battery commander came out and instructed a sergeant to show me how to cut some pine logs to build a fence out of to keep people from driving into the area. 
and he showed exactly how he wanted the logs cut. And I started cutting the logs, and I cut one way like he said, and then I took a hatchet and broke the log the other direction. And this battery commander said, Sergeant, that is not the way I want those logs cut. And uh, that's not the way I told you. So you take that man, and, and I jumped up and told him, I know how to cut these logs. I've done a dozen times like this, and the way I'm doing it is right. And the captain said, take this man to the kitchen where he can learn how to mop and wash dishes and serve lunches. And so, uh, at lunchtime, uh, I carried a platter of chicken to a table of sergeants and corporals and handed it to the sergeant. And he immediately gave it back to me and said, bring us good chicken. So I took the chicken back to a uh, sink where I had been washing and turned it upside down on the trap under the sink and sorted the chicken out with the good stuff on top and handed it back to the sergeant who said, thank you. And I said, think no more of it and turned around and walked back into the kitchen again to start washing dishes. And at the time, uh, a man that was working with me, evidently an old house painter, held up a bottle of lemon extract and said, do you realize this is 50% alcohol? I said, no. So we drank that bottle of lemon extract the rest of the evening and finally went home that night. When we came back the next morning, the pantry where the lemon extract had been was padlocked. Tell us where you went in September 1941 after Camp Bowie and the different jobs you had during boot camp. In September of 1941, the 36th Division was sent to Louisiana for practice battles and uh, so we stayed there several weeks battling uh, practice light and uh, finally were, were sent back to Camp Bowie and uh, I was placed on a switchboard, telephone switchboard, uh, which finally irritated the officers who were calling through this switchboard to try to fire the artillery pieces and too many men trying to get on the line at once. And uh, I had all that trouble besides I decided I would not operate that telephone switchboard anymore and I saw uh, the Army survey crew out there <coughs> holding uh, with a man holding a rod up and would not hold it straight and so I walked over there and told the survey chief that I used to be a rodman and that I know how to handle that rod. He told me, all right, you will be on our survey crew tomorrow morning. And I woke up and went to work with the survey crew the next morning and stayed with them for the rest of the four years learning how to be a surveyor. While you were in boot camp in September 1941, you received correspondence from the IRS. Tell us about that. All right. Prior to entering the Army, I had filled out my Internal Revenue Service uh, tax 
statement uh, for the work I had done on the seismograph crew in 1940 and made good money. Uh, I made all the proper deductions and finally deducted another thousand dollars from my income by stating that I worked away from home for 200 days a year and uh, should deduct a thousand dollars from my income for that year and mailed a letter, the tax to them. And then I received another letter from them uh, saying that they did not know that I was in the army uh, and that all I had to do was to uh, uh, sign a statement saying I would pay this $26 when I got out of the army or pay it now. And uh, so I answered, uh, I tore some brown paper off of a flour sack and wrote them another letter saying that uh, I would not pay this bill and that I would not sign any letters stating when I might pay it. So then they wrote me back and said, you do not have any choice. You have to sign the paper stating you will pay it or pay it. So I went and borrowed stout money again and said, I am only making $21 a month and I cannot pay this. And then they wrote me another letter saying, uh, since you have not paid it and uh, are not willing to pay it, uh, we will send a United States Marshal to your outfit and pick you up. This made me very happy to be picked up by the United States Marshal, so I wrote them another letter and told them, please hurry with the United States Marshal and I will be at the front gate of the Division Artillery Headquarters to be picked up by your man and I will go wherever he wants me to go. Thank you. <laughs> the answer I received from the IRS was, Dear Private Price, we consider your case closed and do not intend to reopen it. And do you still have this letter? Oh yes, I kept that letter for years and even after I got out of the army I kept it in my a uh, safe deposit box in the bank. Later, the 36th D Division moved to Camp Landing, Florida. Tell us about your experience there. We stayed six or eight more months at Camp Bowie and then drove overland to Camp Landing, Florida and where they placed us in the pyramidal tents holding six men each. We stayed here about a year and marched and trained, including surveying and all of the uh, training. And finally it got cold and we were transferred by railroad to Camp Edwards, Massachusetts. After Camp Blanding, you were moved to Camp Edwards, Massachusetts. Tell us about the winter there. We arrived in Camp Edwards in summer uniform khakis, and it was days before the wool uniforms were issued to us, and uh, it was more days before they found wooden buildings, barracks for us to live in. But finally we spent the winter there in barracks that were heated with uh, coal uh, stoves. We had heavy snows all winter, but we continued training 
with surveying and other army trainings. Walter, what happened on your weekend pass to Providence, Rhode Island in November 1942? Oh, all right. In November, Sergeant Mac Vicker and myself got a weekend pass to Providence, Rhode Island, about a hundred miles away. And we got on a bus and went there. And one of my friends on the survey section asked me to buy him three t-shirts, which we were allowed to wear on our underwear. And uh, so we went into a large dry goods store and told the lady we wanted three t-shirts. And uh, so she reached over and got two of them. And, and I asked her, Would, will they shrink? And she said, no, they will not shrink. And I said, but I want three of them. So she reached over and got the next larger size and said, this one here will shrink. So me and Sergeant Mac Vicker ran out of the store and started back toward our hotel. And Mac Vicker was leading the way. He ran in front of a carload of ladies who uh, were, were at the corner and he said something like this, uh, out of my way ladies and let me through. And so we both passed in front of the car and we came up to the curb on the other side and a strange captain said, Hey, Sergeant, what was that you said to those ladies? He spit on the ground and looked at the captain and said, I don't think I said a word to you, Captain, and started running toward the hotel. And I started right behind him. The captain got behind me and said, Corporal, stop that sergeant. So I hollered at him, clapped my hands on my hips and said, uh, wait, sergeant, that captain wants to speak to you. Well, Sergeant Macpicker just got that much faster and me too, and the captain running down the street. Macpicker came to a sign down there that said, uh, uh, Jolly Whaler Saloon, and he opened the door and went in, but it was not a saloon, it was a cleaning room of some type. So we all three went into that room, and they opened another door, and the marble floor of the hotel opened up, and we all three ran toward the elevator, which was open. Mike Vicker got into the elevator, and I did too, but the captain was banging on the door when we started going up. And so we got upstairs and I said, Mike Vickham, we better get out of here. We're in trouble. He said, no, we're not getting out of here. We'll leave here after a while and go to a picture show. So we did. And we spent the night in the hotel there. And uh, when we came out the next morning, there was a man sitting in front of the elevator and started talking to us, asked us if we had a good time or not. Of course we did, and uh, we carried on a conversation. But in a few minutes, uh, 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 the, the captain and, and 4M military police started running towards us. And uh, the military police threw Mac Vicker to the floor. The other two threw me to the floor. And the captain said, you are under arrest, Sergeant. And uh, the military policeman said, what to do with this corporal? And the, the captain said, let him go. So uh, the last I saw of Mac Vicker, they were putting him in a transport of some kind and uh, that and I ran to get on the bus station 
and uh, worried all the way as to what I was going to tell the first sergeant where Mac Vicker might be because I figured I'd get there before he did, before he ever got home. Anyhow, finally, uh, the bus stopped and I got to my outfit and walked in and opened the door uh, to the first sergeant's room and there sat Mac Vicker. And I said, well, how in the world did you get here before I did? And he told me a long story about when they threw him into a brig at Oford Air Force Base a few miles away and from there and uh, that uh, he cut the water on full force and started running it through him to the floor and a military police lieutenant and uh, sergeant came back there and said, what are you doing that for? What do you want? And he said, I want to use this phone to call my general at uh, Camp Edwards, Massachusetts. And they said, yes, you can call a general anytime you want to, and handed him the phone. And so he dialed the general at uh, Camp Edwards, our artillery general, and uh, at the time when the, answer, when the boy answered the phone, it was Mac Vickers' corporal in the office of the general. And Mac Vickers said, uh, Corporal, I want to talk to General Coles. And Corporal said, the general is not here right now. What can I do for you? And so Mac Figger said, I just said, yes, General, I wanted to tell you that I'm up in here in the brig at Ophel Air Force Base and I will not be with you tomorrow morning because I've been falsely arrested and placed in this brig. At this time, the lieutenant, uh, military police, and sergeant ran to the front of the building. And when he hung up the phone, uh, he walked out the door of the brig and they said, what do you want? And he said, I want transportation to the 36th Division headquarters in, Mac, in uh, Camp Edwards, Massachusetts, right now. And they said, well, get in this vehicle. We'll take you there. And so they put him in the vehicle, and he got there before I got there on the bus. And, and that's the story of that until the next morning. Okay. What happened the next morning? <clears throat> the next morning, me and Sergeant McVicker got up to do our duties, and McVicker said to me, get with me and we'll go to division headquarters and get the batteries mail. So I went with him and we brought a big sack of mail back, and he told me, go through this mail and help me find any letter from Providence, Rhode Island. So in a few seconds, he found the letter from a captain in Providence, Rhode Island. And this letter was addressed to our own uh, battery commander. And it stated, Sergeant McVicker, was, uh, has escaped from us here where we had him under arrest and I want him busted to a private because he had no business doing this. And I want evidence that he has been busted to a private sent back to me. And so uh, we read the letter and laughed and finally we tore the letter into a thousand different pieces and flushed it through the local latrine 
and we have laughed about it for three years. And now we discover in looking on the Veterans History Project webpage that Autry Parker McVicker is listed as one of the participants. So you and he both are from the same division and will be in the Veterans History Project. What happened in April of 1943? In April of 1943, the 36th Division was placed in ships in New York City, and we sailed past the Statue of Liberty and to a convoy of a hundred ships. My ship was a converted civilian ship named the USS Brazil. Uh, we were afraid of submarines out in the middle of the Atlantic, and at one point a destroyer did fire some shots at what was thought a submarine. But uh, at the time that it was shot, uh, we were in a bottom hold of the ship, and the doors clanged shut and locked, and the room was absolutely silent. And at the time, all you could hear was 100 watches ticking. But uh, there were no more shots, and we had no more trouble. It evidently was not a submarine. And we landed in Africa in Oran, Africa, ten days later. Many of the stories you tell are written in a war diary that you kept. Tell us about it. This little diary was a three inch by five inch uh, booklet with blank pages in it and it fitted into my shirt pocket and I occasionally would write important information about the names maybe of battles or whatever we were doing, and particularly if anybody got killed and the names of them who got killed. According to your diary, your ship landed in North Africa. Tell us about that. There were a hundred ships protected by balloons hanging above each ship to keep bombers from dropping bombs on us. Not This was not a combat landing. We, we camped near Bajena, Algeria for several days. I was in an artillery group. After a few weeks in Magenta, where did you go? Uh, we left for Morocco and stayed over in Morocco three or four weeks and in a big uh, cork forest. This was near Port Lyoki, Morocco. And we stayed there several weeks, and this trip was all canceled out, and we went back to Oran, Africa, and uh, left Oran, Af Africa, and started to Salerno Bay, uh, Italy, to make the Pestum and Salerno Bay landing. Okay. We Tell us about your landing on Red Beach, which was your first combat experience. We sailed to Italy on the USS Funston <clears throat> and landed on Red Beach near Salerno and at Paestum, Italy. We met one mile inland at a huge tobacco barn and I had seen six tanks burning. 
we captured two Germans who came after us in a tank. A naval officer who came ashore when we saw the tank gave orders to fire six rounds 300 feet from the barn at this tank. But our artillery general said, cease that fire. And our artillery general drove back down to the shore and took a 150 millimeter artillery piece back to the barn and bore sighted this tank and handed the shell to the gunner who uh, fired the gun and set the tank on fire. Two badly burned Germans came out of the tank and we later captured them. That's it. Where did you go after the landing at Red Beach? We, we fought our way into Pasili. Our survey station moved into Dito Lotieri's house where he had a wife and three children who stayed in the house with us. <coughs> Our one night a German artillery started dropping shells in the area close to the house so I went to the basement and led a donkey out of the basement and I slept in the donkey stall because it was safer than being upstairs in the two-story house. Our infantry put cigarettes in dead Germans' mouths, and a goofy type act, uh, because they were dead two or three days before by our infantry who had killed them. What happened on your first Christmas overseas in 1943? Uh, on Christmas day of 1943, I had been sleeping on the floor of a house with a marble floor in it in Bonafro, Italy. And uh, I went out and surveyed a point on top of a hill for the use of artillery firing and there was 26 dead Germans on top of this hill. And I had to go survey another point down near San Pietro, Italy to help control the firing of artillery. And the Germans had us in view when we set the instruments up and started chaining. And they fired four shots but did not hit us. There was a bunch of infantrymen sitting close by who had been slightly injured and were waiting for an ambulance to take them to a hospital. And uh, I uh, and, and they were uh, uh, teasing my chainmen and saying chain and stop and go and this and that and the other and, and imitating my chainmen. But I wanted to drive off and eat lunch at a safer place. Uh, so uh, we walked out and the driver had left with the weapons carrier and gone up the road. So we had to walk a half a mile up the road and uh, ate lunch with the driver. And when we came back, the stake I had left in the ground had been blown out and those dead uh, soldiers had been hit by some of the German artillery. Their heads and 
arms and legs and feet were laying around every direction. And uh, when my chainmen started chaining again, they were so sick at the stomach, throwing up, that I had to go do the chaining and finish the survey. Describe the Rapido River Crossing Massacre, which you witnessed. On January the 19th, 1944, I witnessed the Rapido River Crossing Massacre. Our infantry was massacred as well as the tanks and drivers. I was watching from a house uh, which we had set our headquarters up in, and I saw the tanks coming on, and when they shot at them, the men jumped out of the tanks and ran, and the infantry that was with them also ran and got killed, all of them, and it was a battle defeated. It was a sad sight. Uh, uh. Shortly after the Rapido River Crossing Massacre, your diary shows an entry for February 8, 1944. Tell us about that. On February 8th, uh, I was in a house in Cervaro, Italy, with eight beds in it, which we slept in and lived in for several days. Our general had ordered 500 bombers, and I watched them bomb the Abbey de Casino and uh, the ground around it, because the general thought that we were being uh, observed even for the massacre of the river crossing and therefore he ordered the 500 bombers. The city of Casino was bombed for four hours and completely demolished and on March the 15th an artillery shell hit the house I was in but did not do any damage, and therefore we still slept in it at night. On May the 11th, we crossed the Gustave Line, which was a concrete line uh, to prevent tanks and soldiers from crossing it, and it was full of concrete gun pits, uh, of the Germans, and after that we even cracked the Hitler line, which was also gun emplacements made of concrete. Where were you on June 5th, 1944? On June 5th, 1944, we took Rome without a fight. I went down the next day and walked through and saw the Vatican Church and made a tour of the city by foot. On June the 6th, France was invaded from England and as we drove on through Rome, I saw the historical place, the Colosseum, a large famous building partly in ruins and partly rebuilt, about four stories high. Uh, but thousands of Italians lined the streets and cheered as convoy and convoy of 36th Division artillerymen and troops drove through. We moved through to Grosseta, Italy, which was a fascist town and camp there. 
How did the army find housing for the troops as they moved through Italy? Uh, that was part of my job uh, since I was familiar with uh, surveying and knowing how to get around the streets and my job was to get a jeep or any kind of vehicle and take these uh, painted signs which our carpenter had sawed and made out of wood and painted signs saying reserve for the U.S. Army or reserve for G4 or reserve for survey section or reserve for wire section, reserve for uh, different parts of us. And uh, my order was to find the best houses in town and uh, to either run the people out or even share houses with them. Or it might be a vacant building with uh, uh, as long as it had a roof and, and a door and a window in it. And uh, I would put these painted signs on and later on that day or the next day my outfit would move into them. During the war, you were a one-pack-a-day smoker. What happened to change your mind about smoking? All right, on June the 25th, <clears throat> 1944, I was out hunting souvenirs on the battlegrounds, and they sent Sergeant Foster and a driver named McIntyre and a lieutenant in Jusolian to go take signs to the next town to take houses for our officers and men to live in. But they accidentally got in front of the infantry instead of in back of the infantry where it would be safe. And as they drove on, a German machine gun opened up and killed the driver of the Jeep and knocked the Jeep out of commission. And the lieutenant ran back one mile after hollering at Foster, let's get out of here. But Foster did not answer and the lieutenant came back one mile afoot and I, I kept thinking when he was telling all this that Foster may be in the ditch dead or may be in the ditch scared because he was a two-pack-a-day smoker and he knew he could not run a full mile back. That's the day I quit smoking and four months later we got a letter from Foster saying uh, he had been captured and that he, that some of the men in my outfit owed him money and they should send the money back to his wife in Corsicana, Texas. You mentioned you were out on the battlefield collecting souvenirs when Foster got captured. Tell us what kind of souvenirs you like to collect during the war. I would always go out into where the fighting had been and collect any flags and German insignia, even off of the dead Germans' uniforms and field telephones, German, and I occasionally found a camera and found lots of pistols, German pistols, which I sold to anybody who uh, would pay money for them. And I found under 
an old barn, two rifles, uh, German rifles. One of them had uh, grease or cosmoline, they called it, all over it, which meant it was brand new. And uh, these rifles, uh, later on, mailed home with some uh, bullets in them, bullets with them, and the telephones I mailed home. And after the war was over, I took the two rifles into a gunsmith in Tyler, Texas, and gave him one of them to uh, place a sporting stock on this German rifle, which he did, and made it a beautiful rifle, but actually damaged its value as a souvenir, uh, because it is not all German now. But uh, then also, uh, with this rifle, uh, uh, I have a box that holds the uh, five bullets in the, these little clamp things that fit into the rifle. So it's a five shot rifle and the, in this metal box also is a chain and brush for cleaning the rifle. and. Uh, it's all here as souvenirs 70 years later. <laughs> On one of the occasions that the troops had a chance to rest, you were in Rome. Tell us about what you saw there on your uh, rest. Uh, on June the 26th, 1944, we were taken out of action at Falonaca. Uh, Highway 1 at Massacre uh, and camped on June the 28th in Rome. And in Rome, I walked to the Colosseum and I saw the Pantheon and St. Peter's Cathedral and the Forum and the Church of St. John Lateran, all beautiful buildings. Walter, what kind of illnesses did you have during the war that took you out of action? I had malaria two times, and I even had uh, 102 degrees fever when I landed at Salerno. But anyhow, uh, I also had a big spot of itch on my left leg and a sore about two inches diameter uh, below my knee. And I went to the hospital for that and uh, uh, they used some coal tar ointment on it, which relieved the itching and made it look much better. And in about a week or 10 days, it was nearly gone. But uh, when it broke out again with the same itch and uh, soreness, uh, the hospital told me that maybe I could try to write home and get cold tar ointment. And that's what I did. Uh, and I would write home and ask them about getting me some, some cold tar ointment. And uh, uh, they immediately did, in fact, sent me cold tar ointment for the next year or two. Uh, along with candy and cookies and uh, other delicate things that they thought I might eat. You're showing some V-mail papers. Tell us about how the V-mails were sent. Well, we would write a letter which was censored. Any letters we wrote had to be censored by one of the officers in the outfit. 
and they uh, uh, would then print it on some sort of V-mail deal uh, in much smaller uh, letter and uh, they took care of the mailing of it uh, and now my family even 70 years later has these v-mails that I sent home. Uh, at, at one time uh, when I was in the hospital with, new, with uh, malaria and spent a couple of weeks there <clears throat> I thought I was ready to get out of the hospital and told them so. And finally the officer came by and said, no, you just check that you have pneumonia now, you'll have to stay another week. And so I did. So I spent several times in hospitals. And what were the hospitals like? Uh, most of them were in big tents and even had American nurses and American doctors and some American nurses even, I mean American men nurses. And uh, however, one of them later on in Germany was in a large building in Germany. And uh, so that's what they were like. They were like good. When you got out of the hospital, you were separated from your organization. How did you get back? On September 17, 1944, I left for France on the LST. And uh, this, this was a large ship that carried tanks, it was not a fighting sh ship tank. Uh, I was seasick for the first time because the ship did not ride very comfortably. Uh, and on the metal rear deck of the ship, the first evening out, we had grapefruit juice and sea ration crackers and cookies and other stuff that really wasn't very good to eat, but that was our meal for the day. And uh, we ate it and made a big mess on the wet deck back there. At two o'clock in the morning, I uh, woke up sick and throwing up and went upstairs and walked through this mess. And the boat tilted and I was sliding real fast. Uh, and I saw over there a half-inch steel cable was all that was going to save me from going over, sea, in, over into the ocean. So I prayed and got mad and prayed that I would go over in the ocean and disappear and never be heard of again. But I hit the steel cable real hard and uh, started throwing up more and I threw up for an hour or so and went back to my bed downstairs and uh, later on two days later we landed in France four kilometers west of Barcelles Harbor and I went through several French towns on a troop train which the U.S. government had confiscated and there was a hundred or more of us on this troop train, all of them strangers to each other out of this hospital and it was uh, several days before I was placed back on my organization. You rejoined the 36th Division Artillery Headquarters in October of 1944. Tell us what happened next. Uh, on October 29, 1944, 
the 144th Infantry lost 150 men who were captured and surrounded and kept uh, by the German army. And uh, we in the artillery uh, barred the 442nd uh, Japanese battalion to go in there and bring these men back to us. And they did a real hard fight, but did bring the 144th Infantry back to the division. <clears throat> I was up there trying to do a survey when and was talking to an infantry officer. Uh, our division general came driving through and uh, he had a, a driver and his aide with him in a jeep and uh, he did not stop even though this infantry officer whistled at him to stop because it was too dangerous a spot. Sixty seconds later, a machine gun opened and the general came flying back in with just his driver and without his aide. This aide was Sinclair Lewis's son, a nationally known author. Uh, and that that ended that. I, I went back to my outfit without making any kind of a survey. Because it was so dangerous? Because it was so dangerous to be there. As the 36th Division Artillery advanced, you came close to being in the Battle of the Bulge. Describe that. <clears throat> we advanced into Alsace-Lorraine <clears throat> between France and Germany on November the 27th, 1944. The Battle of the Bulge had started and we were directed to come up to help them, but we stopped at Reberville, Alsace. While walking up to the kitchen to have supper from the house where I was staying, a large German shell exploded a hundred feet from me and killed two friends walking to supper too, uh, named Lot and Mitchell. On Christmas night, 1944, our artillery general threw a big uh, party dance, invited nurses and uh, Red Cross girls, and had our cooks made pies and left them in the windows. And I passed by and took one of the big pies for myself and took it where I was sleeping and we ate it. Uh, we never got to the bank Battle of the Bulls, either because it ended or because we were turned back to go to another job. This is the second videotape for Walter Scott Price, Jr. Um, for the Veterans History Project. The date is April 7th, 2007, and we are at the home of Walter Price. My name is Ann Pontillo. I am his daughter. I will continue the interview. First, Walter, state your name and current address. My name is Walter Scott Price, Jr., and I live in Auburn, California. What, what is your date of birth? My date of birth is January the 17th, 1915. And you are 92 years old at this time. What branch of service did you serve in? I served in the U.S. Army 
36th Division Artillery. What rank did you achieve? Sergeant. And where were the countries that you served? I served in the United States and Africa and Italy and France and Alsace-Lorraine and Germany and Austria. Thank you. After you came close to being in the Battle of the Bulge, you moved on. Where did you go? We, we stopped in Nederville, five kilometers south of Sarburg, and I made a survey on a frozen lake and drove the jeep over the ice which looked to be about four feet thick. On January the 22nd, 1945, I saw a pitiful sight as thousands of French civilians evacuate Hagnall on bikes, sleds, coaster wagons, some autos, some covered wagons, they were eating crackers and whatever else they could carry in paper sacks. We camped in Brumath, France, and the survey section moved into a two-story house with kitchen and lights and water and electricity. And we put wood in a hot water heater, and all of us took a bath. I had a bed with feather uh, comforters on it. On February the 15th, 1945, we were shelled heavily with 280 millimeter artillery pieces. It took the whole outside wall of the house off, but did not damage the inside. So I took my cot and moved downstairs to the basement and bailed the water out so I could sleep in a dry spot in the basement. Uh, I don't remember moving out of this house, but we did. Walter, did you ever experience friendly fire? Yes, I did. On February the 20th, 1945, I was doing a survey when near the Rhine River when four American planes flew over me and started machine gunning me and gunned my section and hit a large American prime mover truck which was passing close by. I jumped into a creek eight feet wide and the bullets hit within inches of my feet and then inches of my head, but the truck was hit and one bullet went through the top of it and hit the steering wheel and went and the boy jumped out of the truck and came over to where we were working and his index finger was hanging by threads. Uh, and one of my men uh, looked at it and said, your finger, it's gone, it's just hanging there. And he barred my pocket knife and cut the string off and threw the finger on the ground. And then we looked down and saw blood 
coming out of his shoe. And I said, let's take your shoe off and let's see what's wrong with your foot. And the boy said, hell no, if that truck will run, I am leaving here right now. What happened to the planes that were flying over you? The second plane in the group shot the front plane down and the pilot parachuted out about 800 feet away from us and stood there and looked at us and was taking his parachute all off, standing in the mud, and we told him uh, to come straight towards us. Uh, when he tried to go down to an easier path, and unless he came straight towards us, we would blow his brains out. He said then, when he got up to us, that he was an American of the 8th Air Force in England, and that they had flown over Czechoslovakia in protecting some bombers who were bombing the oil fields there. And uh, this sounded true and proved to us that he was American. And so we put him in a car and sent him to headquarters where we assume he was sent back to England. Walter, you said earlier that you carried a war diary while you were overseas. Can you show that to us? This is the war diary which I had in my pocket when all of this happened. And this is the page where I wrote it up and uh, when the planes all shot at us and got this deal over with. This is it. Your diary shows that on March 23, 1945, you entered Germany at Schweigen, which is about one kilometer north of Wissenburg, France. You spent the first night in Bergsebern after crossing the German Siegfried lines. Tell us what those were like. The German Siegfried line was a huge uh, size, big concrete blocks shaped so tanks could not come across and get into Germany. But we managed to drive around some of them and slept in the basement of a well shot up house. And uh, then we got to Herxheim where uh, infantry was on the banks of the Rhine. But in April, they pulled us back to rest at Hamburg, Germany. And on April the 12th, to Neustadt, Germany, into a cloth factory, which we were set up to guard. And this cloth factory was full of bolts of German wool material uh, used to make German army clothing and out of. And the American army started hauling all of this back to France because it was called captured booty. And uh, it, we, since we were not on combat duty, uh, we stayed there about a month until they emptied these bolts of cloth and took them back to France. After you left the cloth factory, your diary shows that you went to Bronsbach, Germany, southwest of Nuremberg, Germany, and that you left there on April 28, 1945. You moved through Kralsheim, which was bombed completely down, 
and you cross the Danube River at Gunsberg, Germany on a pontoon bridge. Then you went through Landsberg, Wilhelm, and Magnetsfried, Bavaria, which are all about 25 miles west of Munich. At this time, you tell us that the German army was retreating. Tell us what you saw then. We were sleeping in an abandoned, small, old German schoolhouse. And one of the men in my section looked out the window and saw a person on a bicycle with a dress on and pumping down the street. Uh, this man said, that ain't no girl on that bicycle. <laughs> and he ran out the door and stopped the bicycle. And it was a German soldier who evidently had uh, escaped or left the rest of the retreating Germans and was going whatever way he wanted to on the bicycle. So we let him go. The whole German army was gone and retreating and going down the roads by the hundreds or thousands and maybe being led by one single German officer, maybe armed and maybe not. We kept moving and went through Bodtok and Rotak, about 15 kilometers from the Austrian border. The 36th Division was part of the 7th Army. Tell us what you know about the capture of General Marshal Goring. The 7th Army captured von Rundstedt at Bad Talk and German General Kesselring. And on May the 9th, they also captured General Marshal Goring, who was head of the German Air Force near Kitzbühel, Austria. The Germans were not fighting and all were waiting in houses. In fact, Goring had sent word to the 7th Army that he would only surrender to some American officer and so they sent a lieutenant and a chaplain to the house and picked him up. And later on, I saw Goring and his wife and his daughter eating at one of our officers' messes. About that time, the surrender was signed. Tell us about that and about the rest of your time in Austria. The surrender was signed at 2.41 a.m. at Reims, France, May the 7th, 1945. All resistance was to end at 12.01 a.m. May the 8th. Meanwhile, I am still in Austria and I saw strange sights as thousands of German soldiers were walking the streets unarmed and hunting a place to surrender. Me and my friend Sergeant McVicker picked up pistols which they discarded as they walked through the streets. Uh, I later on sold these pistols uh, for as much as a hundred dollars a piece to American soldiers who had not found any and had not uh, maybe uh, fought up in the front lines. And later they sent us to a shower tent where well, I had to be very careful where I hung my clothes with the money from those pistols stuffed into the front pockets of my pants and I washed my face with one eye closed so I could guard my money. Your diary shows that 
On May the 5th, you crossed the Inn River and moved into Kufstein, Austria. You heard the news of the German surrender to the 7th Army on May the 7th over the radio in Kufstein. Only a pocket of fighting was left, about half of Bohemia and Moravia, which was in western Czechoslovakia. You were proceeding through Germany. What did you see? On May the 14th, we drove through Munich, Germany, which was 75% destroyed by Air Force some months ago. And Augsburg was one mass pile of rubble. Also, on May the 14th, we moved into Memmingen, Germany, south of Augsburg, which was only slightly bombed. We are on the way back toward France to go toward home. We must have stayed until June the 14th, 1945, when we moved to Lofim. On June 28, 1945, you were transferred from the 36th Division Artillery to the 63rd Division Artillery. Tell us why and how the Army determined which soldiers got to go home first. On June 28, 1945, I was transferred from the 36th Division Artillery to the 63rd Division Artillery. Uh, with a group of survey boys who did not have full pointage counts like myself. They sent us in groups depending on the point counts. The dependence was counted on landings, combat landings, and wounds and decorations. I did not have any wounds and did not have any points for a la combat landing in France because I had been in a hospital and came in later on the LST that I told you about earlier. I was sent with a group that did not have full point counts. Uh, first. This was the first step, you tell us, in getting back towards the United States. And meanwhile, yeah. your first. records show that you have a European theater uh, medal, four battle stars, one arrowhead, and an American defense ribbon. And you're now holding up uh, one of those. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Uh, this is my European defense medal with the four battle stars on my right hand side and the one uh, uh, combat landing which was at Salerno, Italy. Your diary states that the last two German towns you were in were Bad Mergentheim and Lauda. Later, after the armistice was signed, between June and September, when you left for home, <clears throat> what did you do in that time? <clears throat> we were driving back through Germany in small pickup trucks with tops on them and uh, other trucks, and we would stop and sleep in towns maybe on 75 mile trips or 100 mile trips and going through these badly bombed up towns uh, in Germany and we were served meals that were the U.S. Army set up in spots and even looked like maybe some German prisoners doing some of the dishwashing and, and working around these spots. What was your experience getting on the victory ship to sail for home? 
It was September the 18th, 1945, before I sailed for the United States from Le Havre, France. I was on the USS Cody, and at 10.30 p.m. we started. The Victor ship was very hot and very crowded, and we had to eat in groups with certain color stamp on your shirt collar, and I would get in line and have to stand in line for over an hour before they would get the food served into your platter, by which time I was sick at the stomach and I would shove the plate of food to the man next in line and tell him, you eat it because I was throwing up all the way up the stairs and out. Where did you land in the United States? We landed five days later in Norfolk Bay, Virginia. We were all told to go phone home and tell our relatives that we would be there soon. And it was uh, a week or ten days later before the train got me to Fort Sam Houston, Texas, where I was discharged on October the 8th, 1945. At this time, you were 30 years old. What did you do in the days and weeks after your service ended? <clears throat> after discharge, I loafed for about three months around my old hometown of Palestine, Texas, which is where I was drafted from. And I went back to work for the Gulf Oil Company as a surveyor instead of a, a dynamite shooter, and uh, which I previously had been four and a half years later. Uh, and this was January 1946, and about a year and a half after that, I got married, and I had never seen any of my old friends or soldiers in the 36th Division. I did try to contact my friend Sergeant Mac Vicker, but was unable to find him. Walter, you sent home a letter to your family on December 8, 1943. Your mother later retyped it. Please read the letter as you hold it in your hands now. The roads are knee-deep in mud. Army vehicles stretch as far as the eye can see either direction. And then the wandering, homeless, hungry, cold and penniless Italian civilians also clutter up the roads. It is these people who are paying the price for their folly. Destruction of homes, public utilities, bridges, everything is complete as the armies move northward. Stone and mortar lie from one to fifty feet deep along the path. One lesson that all the soldiers will have learned by the time they return is that regardless of the cost, war is and always will be cheaper in any place other than America. As long as the globe keeps spinning, there will be wars and the biggest loser is the nation upon whose grounds the battles are fought. The weather here is not so cold yet, but the whole field is one big sea of mud, making life pretty miserable, especially when you have to eat, sleep, and fight, and dodge shells in the gooey mess. I'm lucky at present, 
since we are using Italian dining room for an office and I sleep upstairs in his attic. I do not get on the front lines every day, but get quite a few thrills when I do. It was pretty hot here for a while. I never will forget how I shook when I heard the first bomb coming down. Each one sounds like it's coming straight at you. I usually get a kick watching the act act, but I turn over on my stomach and voluntarily black out when I hear a bomb on the way. Uh, about 50% of a man's chances in war or pure unadulterated luck or fate or whatever you want to call it. Of course it doesn't hurt to help fate by ducking right fast when you can, but I've known guys who ducked into foxholes when they would still be able to duck again today if they hadn't done it then, but still I duck. War is rough, but training for war is really rougher on one mentally, morally, and physically, I believe. Thank you, Walter, and thank you for your service to your country.